around the world in various marine life, from zooplankton to shrimp to walrus to you name it. And she put together this soundscape. Uh, this is called Coming on the Backs of Whales. And um, you can turn it up a little bit more, if you don't mind, please. So the ocean is a sound universe. And this is how animals forage. This is how they find mates. This is how they know whether a predator is near. This is how they know a lot of different things. We'll hear more about that in just a moment from Michael Stalker. Um, but just take a minute and listen to this soundscape that Susan Alexander put together. Some of the sounds we would hear if we were marine species underneath the ocean. So forth. Thank you. Sorry, I can't translate. <laughs> yeah, uh, this is actually available online. You can go to um, Our Sound Universe and order coming on the backs of whales. Susan Alexander is a bioacoustic composer. I met her when she was 40. I think she's now 80. Could that be true? I think it is. And uh, She's also done a lot of real interesting bioacoustic samplings with DNA, quasars, and so on. Um, she told me once if her grandchildren never knew what she was doing, they'd lock her up because she has a room about this size with strings going from the ceiling to the floor in all different directions, matching up sounds from the planets and stars that she's measured with scientists to our marine life in the ocean. And what she has found is that these sounds that are in opposite places, right, spaces, create perfect harmonics. Perfect harmonics. So get on her website. She's published a lot of articles. And, uh, you know, there's something going on that's so much bigger than what we know as human beings. This idea of sound and harmonics. Imagine the Milky Way, the stirring of the planets, the quasars, the black holes, all that have been measured and we know make sound of some kind. Coming into unison, into harmonics, into harmony with ocean life. This is profound. So as we think about these things and we talk about it for the afternoon, it's going to be a great afternoon, um, we need to remember that idea there's something bigger than us, this idea of spiritual renewal that Howie was talking about on our last panel before lunch, this idea of science and art and spirit merging and emerging to lead the way towards healing everything that's been going on. So with that, I'm so honored to introduce my friend and colleague, Michael Stalker. Michael's an extraordinary acoustic scientist and he will 
tell you more about what he does. Thanks, hey. Hey, Michael, thanks so much. So, yeah, that's good, I'll take that off. So I'm honored to be here. Thank you guys for hanging out this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> what uh, I'm gonna do is kind of try to compress it as much as I can, but into 35 slides, which means I'm gonna have less than a minute, less than a minute per slide, but we'll make it happen. Um, talking about the ocean as an acoustic environment, the sources of ocean noise pollution, what impacts it has, and some solutions that we're working on and other people are working on. So uh, with no further ado, uh, the, acoustic, uh, the ocean is an acoustic environment. It's dark down there. Uh, animals need to get around at night. They don't just take a nap and wait for the sun to come up. They get down a couple hundred feet. Uh, there's absolutely no sunlight or very little sunlight at all. So you get into this uh, situation where they actually need sound to calibrate the relationship with their surroundings. Um, and there's a lot of different variations on it, a lot of different adaptations. Uh, this is something that you hear pretty much in all temperate waters. I heard it in that particular uh, take there from Susan Alexander. You see it in the background. It's a snapping shrimp. And they snap with their claw like that. This is slow motion. It creates a cavitation bubble and that bubble pops and it's so loud that it stuns the prey of the little zooplankton around them. So they stun the prey and then they eat the zooplankton. That's their way of getting around. Uh, this happened to be a mana shrimp, actually two mana shrimps, a male and a female. And they, they built these uh, tunnels they live in together for 20 and sometimes up to 30 years. And when they get in the mood, they sing these little songs to each other. They're purring. Um, and this is really the sound of a healthy reef here. So those are, you know, essentially fairly simple. This is one that, that, that baffled a lot of people until they found out what it was. Croakers. Croakers are, are basically dispersal uh, breeders, so they get together and they and when they all get excited enough, they start distributing their their spermatozoans and their, and their eggs, and it turns into a big orgy, a croaker orgy. So. Everybody knows this one. I was actually up in, in Alaska a couple of weeks ago and I was in a, um, a bar restaurant and I started playing sounds this. And literally three people in the restaurant said, hook that whale. They're so impressive. We heard at the end of Susan's take there this pulsing that was going on, kind of And that was actually, um, it's in the Rorqual family, it was a fin whale, um, but it's related to these guys here. The Mickey whale. Um, I, I have a paper out and presenting on, on chorusing behavior of animals. And the minkies, it seems like they actually chorus like crickets. They synchronize with each other in those pulses. Um, what else do we get? What's coming next? Oh, the the carpenter. <laughs> An old one for the sperm whales. It sounds like a bunch of journeyman carpenters, you know, on, on Monday morning trying to. <laughs> um, and of course. I think everybody knows this one. I could listen to this a lot. 
in the wrong. So great. Um, the challenge, of course, we have is that uh, we're also inhabiting the ocean, and particularly since the beginning of the uh, mechanization of transportation, we have uh, shipping noise pretty much everywhere. And if those of you saw the movie last night saw the impact of shipping noise on marine habitat in the northern southern hemisphere. But there are some 60,000 boats at any given time, big ships on, on the ocean transporting um, cargo. And they might sound like this. So it's a, a, one of the problems because all those really sweet sounds of the orcas and all these other animals, it gets drowned out by this broadband, thumping, nasty sound. Um, here's another problem we're having is a seismic survey is looking for fossil fuel in the ocean. Um, and this is just one. So unfortunately, we water is. We're doing a survey um, right now. We're monitoring a survey that, that just stopped on Thursday but they're kicking off those explosions every three to five seconds, around the clock, for a month and a half. So we've got that recorded. Um, they're doing this everywhere in the world, but uh, what, what they have is this is an air gun. You'll see this. It's, this is not gonna sound, this one here. Oh, what? there it goes. So they'll have an array of those. This is a small, this is like a 40-inch a, a gun. Uh, a small one, but that pulse hits, creates this boom, it goes down into the substrate, it picks up uh, the perturbations of uh, the a strata underneath the ocean floor, kicks back a signal, which they then have these streamers, and they listen to that, they synthesize it, process it, and they figure out what that what's actually looks like down, you know, where the, where the oil deposits are and where it's most fruitful to, to do that work. Um, and uh, the deeper water requires you know, more uh, air gun energy, deeper, deeper deposits as well. Um, as I said, this is a streamer. It's basically got six going on behind it, but the one we were uh, monitoring had 14, and there's ones that have up to as many as 40 devices uh, and 4,000 cubic inches. And these are the, oops, I'm sorry, this boat here. Can you see that? Oh, I see, I need, I need actually have my, that guy, that's, that's a Ramform PGF. And that boat was designed to do surveys on the Atlantic seaboard, which we managed to be, you know, keep at bay for the last, well, when they wanted to start doing it since 2007. Ramform was actually built in, in 2014. It's a billion dollar boat. And these guys are, you know, they want to get their money back. So that, well, they, and it's really designed for really specific types of uh, seismic work. This is where they're doing it in the world right now. So if you stuck a hydrophone in the Mid-Atlantic Ridge here, you could hear Brazil, you could hear that, not so the Gulf of Mexico is a shallow here, but you'd hear up in the, the, the Bay of Fundy in this area, Hudson Bay area, and you'd hear the, 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 you know, off of Norway. You would hear this roar and clatter of these things a thousand miles away, or 1,500 miles away. And what are they doing with that? This is another component of it that they're not really speaking about from a sound standpoint, but they're building these uh, seafloor processing plants. It's kind of a, um, it's a refinery, it's a pre-refinery. When you stick a straw into the earth, you don't pull out oil and gas that you can use. You pull out this slurry of all kinds of stuff, toxic materials, sand, brine, and so they don't want to pull that stuff all the way up to the surface because it's expensive and they got to do something with it. So they have all this equipment down below, they separate it, and then they re-inject the stuff that they don't want back into the earth, and then they pull the stuff that they do want up. But that is mechanical sound, and this is um, what it sounds like. So when, wherever they have those things, which is essentially where they have this stuff here, around the clock, 24 hours a day, forever. 
it's going to sound like that. And then, of course, every few months they have to do another seismic survey to determine the condition of the drawdown. So uh, there's a lot of noise being created out there which is not being regulated because people are not really thinking about it. And what are those pieces of equipment? This is a seafloor separator. See these three little guys there? It's a big piece of equipment. And this is a reinjection pump. And see that? That's not a to that's not a matchbox. That's a you know just for size comparison. It's also not on the bottom of the ocean, but it's a size comparison. And uh, if you look at the noise that the stuff creates, this is just a single pump turbo turbo compressor, um, and it's well above the continuous noise threshold of 120 dB, and it's a continuous noise. So these are out of compliance in terms of a like regulatory standpoint. Um, and there's other noises that were being introduced down there. In order to control all that equipment, they have to have ways of communicating to service vessels, autonomous uh, um, AUVs that are going down and turning knobs on and, and opening up valves and you know adjusting pipes and things like that. And they communicate through these communication networks, the digital communication networks. And again, these are things that are being set off uh, in large areas. So we're colonizing huge areas of the ocean. And these might be areas that had been productive feeding areas for, for dolphins or porpoises or, or uh, uh, you know, the, the cetaceans, the uh, adonis that would hear this level of noise, this type of noise. But here's some examples. essentially colonizing, acoustically colonizing huge areas of the ocean, um, much to the stress of the animals that are, are there. Um, if you were here last night at the point in the movie where they said, and they don't have any doors to walk out of, and all of a sudden this alarm went off. <laughs> and we could walk out, but even then we were outside, and we said, where do we sit with and, and, you know, it's hard. Um, there was an awful lot of this happening. They're starting to get a little bit more wise about it, but we were getting catastrophic strandings of marine mammals as a consequence of some of these uh, underwater sonar systems. And this is uh, one of the culprits here. This is Charlie 53. Yeah, and now, you know, that, that, that will go on until they're done with their operation. So we have, you know, we have a serious problem um, with the noise in the ocean. Again, the Navy is getting a little wiser about this. I mean, they don't like seeing this stuff. This is 800 dolphins, and this was from a NATO exercise. Mm -hmm. And the, the collection of pictures I have from this, because somebody sent me a bunch of this stuff, and they had this, this um, it was like a buoy. It was a, a seismic uh, tailor, tailor buoy. It wasn't sound making. He says, is this making it? No, no, this is a military thing. So we ended up excavating that and finding some problems. You say 800? 800. Yeah, this was in Madagascar. They were doing a NATO exercise off Madagascar, and that and 800 dolphins, and you know, including you know, so some of the pictures I have from this are females with aborted babies, you know, the little babies that just and they're on the or animals that have been eaten, bitten by sharks because when they can't hear, when you deafen them, they don't know what's going on. So one of the reasons we think they might be beaching themselves is because you know, why live if we're going to be eaten slowly by sharks? Um, so, so we're introducing a lot of new uh, technologies, as I said, the deep water subsea, hydrocarbon exploration production. Offshore wind has got its problems. They've got these, um, these large masts with, uh, with these transmissions as gears up in gearboxes upstairs and they transmit down into the, the column. Um, offshore tidal has got its own collection of noises. Um, it's power distribution, as, as uh, Doug was saying, talking about yes, uh, earlier today. Um, different types of resource mining, meth methane hydrate mining, which is at, you know, at the edge of the, of the continental shelf. There's a lot of methane hydrates there. It's going to take a lot of mechanical energy to get that out, like any mining. Any deep water mineral minerals mining. Um, out of continental shelf, well, just navigation beacons in general. And I'm trying to get people alerted to this. Finally, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is starting to pay attention to me. But uh, the people at NOAA, off of protective resources, are like, I can't wake them up. But, the, the Navy is proposing a global GPS system, which would mean there would be buoys every 10 to 20 kilometers in the ocean, all kicking out some digital sound. And because of the physics of sound transmission in the water, this would be in a, 
you know, in the human hearing range, so it would be somewhere between 10 and 20 kilohertz, probably more like 10 and 12. And that means when you're out in Hawaii on beautiful moonlit night with the glassy waters and bobbing and you hear this coming through the hull of your boat. Everywhere in the ocean. It's like, stop, don't do that. Bad idea. Outer continental shelf, sorry. Uh, so the multi node communication networks I was talking about and uh, low frequency uh, active over the horizon communications for fish finding and stuff like that. So these are noises that we're introducing, already exist, uh, or are developing. Um, I didn't put any of these sounds on here. But the TIV vortices on these things are also, aside from the gearboxes, you hear this kind of, you know, every three seconds because it's going pretty slow. Um, we don't know what the impact is. There's places like in the Black Sea where when they were installing, uh, they were not on these floating masts. These are the ones that we'd be putting off California. Um, these ones are in shallower waters. Uh, they have pile driving. So there's ways of isolating. I'll show you that in a minute. But um, in the, both the North Sea, you know, off the coast of England and off the coast of Holland, when they were installing these things, all the harbor porpoises and harbor seals just left the area. Uh, in the Black Sea, they've recruited back to it. Now there's vertical feeding space, and there's actually maybe fisheries collecting around here. The problem with these masts like that is they have to be anchored down with these wires, and there's really nothing in the repertoire, behavioral repertoire of the whales that migrate to know that there's actually a big wire that they're going to run into. So they could bump their heads, bump their, their fins or whatever. But, you know, that was a question somebody asked about what the impacts of, of, of offshore wind are. But, you know, here we are. Um, the pile driving, uh, again, it's just this kind of, this pounding and the, and the sound goes out into the surroundings. Where this was first seen as a problem when they were actually doing the seismic retrofit in 2000 on the Bay Bridge, they were pile driving, and all of a sudden they started realizing all these seabirds that were feeding on the top of the water. And they were feeding on what? They were feeding on uh, juvenile fish, you know, mostly salmon smolt. And, um, and so they stopped. We have got to figure out how to solve this problem. And, and a friend of mine did a lot of modeling on that. Found out that these fish, it wasn't just the noise itself. It was the impulse of the, the bear trauma that was actually blowing these animals up that had these little swim bladders. So it was actually blowing them up from the inside rupturing their kidneys. Uh, that was a lot of fun. Um, these are interesting. Uh, they haven't really gotten a lot of progress on this. It's still a little wonky. Uh, it's a, a, it's, they float on top of the water, and by flexing over the, the swells, they actually create hydraulic pressure inside. But they crank, and they clang, and they're, you know, so it's, it's not what you call um, a necessarily quiet. Um, this is one that was really surprising. I've got the fishing efforts here. Uh, seal bombs are used to scare seals away from nets and, and fishing efforts. The seals, you know, when they hear when they hear that fish being stressed out, they know there's easy prey, and so you'll be catching, you know, grilling in a fish, and all of a sudden it gets lighter, and you pull in just the head, and the seal's gotten the rest. So fishermen have been kind of permitted to use these seal bombs, which are about the size of I don't know if you guys know M80s. So it's like a quarter of a stick of dynamite. And they you know, light them and throw them in the water, and it harasses the seals. But this was from the Mars Project, which is the uh, offshore seismic, uh, uh, offshore hydrophone uh, off of um, Marin, uh, Monterey Bay that uh, John Ryan is running. And if you look at the numbers of seal bombs per hour, per day, you know, there's a, it's an interesting metric. You know, we're talking about, in some cases, hundreds of them over the course of a day. And um, this is opening day at Bristol Bay, so there's obviously the, the, the propeller problem. Um, and deep sea mining, this is some of the, one of the ways of doing it is this boat is not walking, actually. It looks like it's kind of wandering around like a fish, like a walking fish or a chicken. But it's uh, sucking up uh, mineral supplies, and they process it up here. They don't talk about the plumes, but there's also going to be mechanical noise there. Um, they have these you know, essentially little uh, s s steam shovels and things like that. They're exc or excavators that are, that are going to be down there, kind of, you know, they're, they're electric. They're not run on, you know, uh, air breathing fuel, but uh, so that, that at least you don't have that sound, of the, that sound of the mechanics, but there is mechanical noise associated with it. So what are the impacts? Um, 
I think it was uh, Doug mentioned earlier, they mentioned certainly last night, the elevated stress levels, the cortisol levels of the animals increases significantly uh, when they're being stressed out with sound. Just like, a, you know, if we did our cortisol last night when this alarm went off, we'd all be like, what's going on? And it's, uh, so it, 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 it's not just unpleasant, it also compromises these animals' ability to, to, to you know, to breed and, and uh, migratory disruptions happen. Um, a friend of mine was uh, Manuel Castellote, who's, uh, who, who's I'm working with up on this project up in Alaska right now. He was monitoring the migration of fin whales um, between the Luzerian Sea, which is up in uh, kind of uh, Italy, you know, on, the, on the western side of Italy, uh, down to Malta, where they were breeding and feeding the fin whales, uh, pulse, uh, like at the end of that particular um, uh, take from Susan Alexander. The pulsing, uh, the common pulsing is an interval of 10 to 15 seconds. And so he was monitoring for, th for three years. The first two years they successfully did their migrations. The third year they went part way down and then they went back to the Luxurian Sea. And so he scanned around with his, with his arrays to find out what's going on and found that there was a seismic survey happening on the coast of Sul off of, off of Spain. And the pulse interval was about the same pulse interval as the, as the fin whale. So it's just conjecture, but there's a possibility that these animals thought there's some strange version of ourselves down there that are, are relentlessly making noise and they're not synchronizing with us, they're not communicating with us, and they might have spooked them. It's just one of the thoughts, anyways. Um, of course, behavioral disruptions. Let's get out of here. Uh, this is scaring me. Um, so. Um, and then physical damage to internal organs, as I mentioned, with the fish, but also uh, one of the things that they found with, with the beaked whales in, in the Bahamas is that these animals um, essentially responded to a, a startle response. And because they had uh, compressed gases in their bodies, when they headed up to the surface, which, which marine mammals do, their, their first impulse is, I need air. And they headed up too fast, and they got the bends. Their, their insides looked like milkshakes. Um, but the other, like the, the impulse from the um, pile driving on the fish, that was, you know, a, it, it uh, ruptured the kidneys and, and often uh, ruptured their uh, swim bladders. So, and of course, hearing compromise. Uh, when you have a, a loud noise, it shifts your threshold. And if you do that enough, uh, your hearing gets worse and worse. And if you need sound really to get around, like we need eyesight, um, uh, it's, not, it's not a good... Not a good solution. Okay, uh, zooplankton mortality. This is what we're studying. There's a seismic survey, as I mentioned, it's just uh, stopped on Thursday. But there seems to be evidence of zooplankton mortality around these surveys. Um, and so we went up there, we put the, uh, our moorings in the day before the survey started. It was like, oh my god, we got to do this fast. And then two weeks ago, it went and we did some uh, zooplankton um, samples right in front of the survey ship and immediately behind it to see uh, if there was, in fact, zooplankton uh, damage. And it, it appears, anecdotally, initially we do. What we have to do, uh, so we dyed them. We put them in a neutral dye. The ones that are alive and, uh, respire this dye, and it dyes their, their, their inner, internal organs. And the ones that are dead don't. So you see the difference quite clearly between ones that are dead and ones, ones that are alive. And that's in the lab right now. Um, let's see. Yeah, I don't want to get into too, too technical on it. So what, what I think is happening, if you remember that, um, that one air gun, you had this bubble that went out, and then it went in really fast. Animals are built to handle pressure gradients because they go up and down the water column. So I don't think that's what's happening. What I think is happening is when you have the inverse, when it, when it retracts, you have a negative barotrauma, and no animals is, or body is prepared to handle that. It's like what would happen if we jumped out of an airplane at 30,000 feet, our blood would boil, because we're not designed to handle negative pressure like that. So, um, so if that truth to be the case, I say these are in the lab right now, and we're, we're going to further that particular research by uh, getting an air gun and doing cage studies, high-speed video cage studies of zooplankton and finding out what the, what the uh, modality is. Um, so there's some solutions. Yay. Okay, the top one, stop buying crap from overseas. Yeah. Uh, you know, consumer society is really, really killing us. Ride your bicycle, take public transit, carpool, and roll back the open mobilization of the world. I mean, those things are really systematic problems that we're really backed ourselves into a cul-de-sac on, and we really need to stop it. 
and, and it's, it's getting up painfully apparent. And fortunately, it's also getting obvious from a public uh, communication standpoint. So um, technical solutions, uh, I'll detail these a little bit more in, in the next five minutes that I have here. Uh, quieting technologies and vessel design, they do things like a decouple vibrating machinery from the hull so you don't get this, pulp, this hull just, uh, um, radiation of, of vibration. Um, damping, attenuating mechanical noises. Uh, for the surveys, there's a marine vibro size, I'll show you that in a second. Um, you can isolate the sounds, of, uh, for example, of pile driving, there's different ways of isolating that sound from, from the water around it. Um, and one of the things that we're working on a lot is uh, deriving more comprehensive propagation models because the regulation really hinges on ability to be able to understand what the impact is at the animal. And the most of the uh, propagation models that are being used in the environmental impact statements from the, the Navy and industry, whatever, are very rudimentary. They're, they're, they're relying on this model that, that you know, is kind of, uh, what can I say, it's high school physics. Um, and then create more accurate noise exposure metrics. So to, just to get, get us a little bit deeper here, this is a standard propeller. You see the cavitation. All those bubbles are making all kinds of noise. Uh, I was working with a, a company called Pax Scientific for a while, and this is a propeller that they've designed. And they've got a couple of variations on this. In order to get this to cavitate, we actually had to stick it under a negative tor, which means that we had to depressurize so we'd actually see the disruption. And Obviously, even if it was cavitating like that, it would be a more, uh, a, a less stochastic noise and more consistent sound, probably a little bit less damaging for the animals. Um, so the seismic survey stuff, this is marine virus size. There's a couple of different variations of this thing. But instead of having what this does is creates, it's, it's the same amount of energy but spread over a longer period of time. So it's quieter. And so you, you can actually create the signals that are below uh, regulatory thresholds that are not as damaging to the animals in terms of impulse noise. In terms of, you know, uh, long-term or continuous sound, I, I, I think it's still problematic, but it's, you know, I think it's an improvement. Um, here are some isolation techniques here. Uh, this is a bubble curtain. They have one down here. Uh, the problem with this is you uh, can only go so deep because it takes a lot of energy to push the air down that far. Uh, this is another friend of mine, uh, Mark Orkner, has designed this whole thing. These are, these are Hemmels resonators. Um, and there's other couple of other resonator designs people are, are using right now. And it, it does actually attenuate the sound uh, propagation from the, from the pole out into the surrounding area. Um, where are we out here? Okay. More accurate propagation models. I don't want to get into the size of this, but the, the things like the speed of sound in the water, uh, that has some bearing on attenuation over distance. Um, there's a whole thing that we, I did a paper on, on uh, what is the communication network at high frequency propagation models of this. And, and because it, they usually are doing uh, regulation on a point source basis, they have one piece of equipment and they say, well, that's you know, only um, kicking out 190 dB at this frequency, so it attenuates in this particular. That's not how it works. You, you don't have one piece of equipment, you have lots of them, and you have to look at the entire field. Uh, this is some of the scrambled eggs we do to make it work. Um, uh, we're doing another thing on signal kurtosis, sound quality. So uh, all the signal, signals that they've been using to set uh, regulatory thresholds are usually pure tones or band limited pink noise. They're, they're, they're pleasant sounds. But the sounds, we heard some of the sounds earlier, they're not all pleasant. And so we are coming up with a metric uh, that expresses what they call kurtosis. kurtosis has to do with variability of, of sets over time, but uh, we find that <coughs> is a lot worse than huh? And so we have a way of evaluating the difference between that, even if with equal energy level. And, and it's not just more annoying, it's also more physiological dam physically damaging. So we have all the bits pulled together, we have to find out there's one variable that I'm looking for, which hopefully I'll have by the time I have to give this paper in, Dece in December on, on this uh, kurtosis metric. Um, but if we have more accurate exposure models, impact models, um, then we can actually start changing our signals that we're using. We don't have to use those nasty digital signals. We can use signals that sound more like beluga whales. You know, we'd be doing biomimicry. You know, and uh, 
sounds that animals may not be able to translate directly, but would be more familiar with. So those are the types of solutions that we're looking at. If we have a metric which expresses impacts, and we can use that to model the sounds that we make, then we can actually come up with solutions to those problems and not uh, you know, stop the whole train or get everybody out of the pool immediately. So summary, ocean is acoustic environment. Military industry is colonizing the ocean. New technology being introduced. New noises are being introduced. And there's some solutions to decrease or impact on marine life. And there we are. Thank you. And I'm going to put my book up there. I've got a book. I've got a box of books if somebody wants a book. Thanks. Thank you, Michael. Wow. Woo. Um, uh, we can do a few questions and we have to move on. Yeah. So, Uh, we've managed to keep the exploration off the Atlantic and Pacific right now. The current administration is just itching to get oil wells off of here because they want to punish us for being Californians. Um, and the Atlantic, but, but where is it happening? You saw that map. It's happening everywhere. But they can do it. Are they restricted by any Well, it depends on where they are. I mean, every condition about off Angola, you know, they have to have military boats to defend those things because there's a lot of pirates out there that, that see value. Namibia is a different story, you know, it's more civil. So every nation has a relationship. Brazil is like, you know, it's open for business right now. Uh, out of question is, do you have a video presentation of your presentation? Because it's so educational. Oh, great organization. Yeah. Yeah. organization, Michael. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, there is now. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my organization, Ocean Conservation Research, is OCR.org. We've been I've been working on this for, for since '92, and OCR has been around since 2007. There's a lot of material on there. There's a sound library. Uh, there, there's all I mean, just a trail of detritus that I've left behind me. So, <laughs> so go there. All right, thank you, Michael. Woohoo! All right. Um, I wanted to let you know there's several things. One is Power's going out, we think, at five. Luckily, the five is the new update. What that, five is the new three, thank you, Michael. So what that means is, um, oh, that's your PowerPoint, uh, laptop. So what that means is uh, we are scheduled to end at four. We're probably gonna end a tad later, but Many of you maybe need to go home and fill buckets up with water, you can flush the toilet, that kind of thing, because it's going to be going through mid-Monday, right, Scott? Um, and, yeah, and unfortunately, that means we can't have our meet and greet that Sheila and Natalie and others had worked so hard to put together for us at Noyo Center for Marine Science, because they won't have any lights or power. So we can't do that meet and greet this time. But. I wanted to let you know that we are planning in March, unbeknownst to some of